Go on. Pretend, <laughs> pretend you like me. Go on. <laughs> okay. Am I ready? Okay. Um, are we ready to go now? Or uh, okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm Dr. Rosser, Dave Rosser. I'm the medical director of University Hospitals Birmingham. This is Stefan Edmondson, who's one of my colleagues who's the specialist in a certain part of the procedure, namely around the titanium plate, which I'll talk about a bit later. And the purpose of today's um, briefing is, I guess, twofold. One, to give you an update on Malala's condition since, since uh, our last brief at the media uh, about her, and secondly, to go through um, some, of, some of the details of the procedures uh, that we are planning for her in the next week or so. Uh, and in general terms, Malala has been recovering very well since, since her last briefing. She's, most of her treatment has been as an outpatient, uh, um, supported obviously by a range of therapy services from, from the organisation supporting her rehabilitation. She has undergone a, a further surgical procedure since um, we last uh, spoke, and that is, was to repair her left facial nerve, which was damaged by the, the course of the, of the bullet. Uh, and uh, the, the facial nerve, as it comes under the ear, about here, was damaged by, by the, the passage of the bullet. And so the nerve, one of our surgeons, Mr. Irving, has re-routed the facial nerve over the top of her ear and reconnected it uh, above here. He's managed to do that without uh, having to graft the nerve, uh, which he would have done if, he, if the, nerve, the, the, the remaining nerve had not been long enough. He would have used a bit of nerve from a leg. Uh, to, to graft the nerve. He's managed to do that without doing that. He's managed to reroute it. So um, uh, Malala does have uh, a, a weakness in her face such that her left side of her mouth drops. Uh, and there is a very good chance after this procedure that within a year to 18 months this will completely recover. Uh, so that's the only, surg that's the only um, complex surgical procedure that she's had done since we last spoke. Uh, she's got over that very well. She's now uh, well enough that she's in a position for what we hope will be her last uh, surgical procedure or procedures, I should say, before um, really concentrating fully on, on rehabilitation and um, you know, non-technical sur surgical recovery. The procedures she will be undergoing in the next week or so, uh, uh, there are two procedures. First is uh, called a titanium crani cranioplasty. And I know some of you, uh, if not all of you, will have seen a video that we, we released explaining so, some of that. This is very simply speaking, and uh, Stefan will be able to um, address any details that anybody wishes to, to ask us. But very simply speaking, this is putting a titanium plate, um, a, a specially made, a custom made titanium plate over the deficit in her skull, which is uh, of this sort of size in, in the... Uh, Left hand, uh, left hand side of her skull. Clearly, this is primarily to offer physical protection uh, uh, to her brain in the same way as a uh, normal skull uh, was uh, would. Um, she does still have the um, portion of skull that was removed in Pakistan in the initial surgery implanted in uh, her abdomen, uh, but the surgeons in consultation with uh, Malala have... Um, decided that the fitting of a titanium plate is a better uh, long-term procedure than trying to re-implant uh, re this bone after such a long period of time. And that's um, at least partly due to the fact that some of this bone will have resorbed so the bone won't be as big as it was. Um, so instead of replanting the bone, the bone will be uh, removed from under the skin in her s stomach uh, and um, cleaned up and sterilised and given to Malala, who wishes to keep it for, uh, for uh, as a, a memory, I guess. The second part of the procedure she'll be undergoing is um, a cochlear implant. Uh, the reason for this is that the passage of the bullet uh, destroyed both uh, her eardrum and the middle ear and the tiny bones within the middle ear that, that um, are essential to hearing. Uh, so Malala is currently profoundly uh, or completely deaf in her left ear. So after the plate has been fitted, um, the, uh, one of the um, ear specialist surgeons will fit the cochlear implant. Um, both of these procedures normally would take about 90 minutes. Um, clearly, particularly the cochlear implant may be surgically more difficult than normal because uh, the surgeon will have to work around the um, plate and the d damaged anatomy from the bullet and indeed previous surgery. Uh, we're not envisaging any significant difficulties. As I say, normally we would... Um, 
expect each procedure to take about 90 minutes. It may take a little longer due, due to some of the uh, anatomical um, difficulties of previous surgery and previous injuries. Um, and that's really all I wanted to say by way of um, introduction and um, happy to field any questions. Dave Rupert, even from ICD News. Uh, excuse my medical ignorance, but I was unaware that you had been, just to explain, you've been storing a fragment of Malala's skull in her abdomen? Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's quite a common procedure. We, we tend not to do it here, but there are certainly units within uh, the UK that still uh, undertake this procedure, and it's very common um, uh, worldwide. That if a fragment of bone is either re um, needs to be removed because of trauma in this case at the time, or sometimes patients who have severe brain swelling surgeons will electively cut off a bit of skull to allow the brain to swell. Um, the safest way to store that bone, keeping it um, sterile and, and healthy, is, is in the patient's body. So they, they will tuck it, they'll just make an incision in, in the skin uh, and tuck it under the skin in, in the abdomen until such time as the patients are well enough to have it re-implanted. And, and you faced a choice then to either reuse that piece of bone or a titanium plate. Yes. You've gone down the titanium route. Did you give Malala any say in that? And, and yeah, how come it, she's chosen to save that piece of bone? Absolutely. It was Malala, Malala's final decision. Um, I think uh, I'm straying onto Stefan's territory, but uh, from my understanding, I think we would have always, need, always needed some titanium because there was a... Uh, a, a area of bone of skull that was completely destroyed by by the bullet. So um, I think probably the the main reason would be if you can have a small bit of titanium, you may as well have the entire deficit covered. I mean, I don't know if you if you want to say any more about that, Stefan. Well, I think with the titanium, there's a very low infection rate with titanium as well. Um, it's a it's a commercial, commercially pure medical grade type two titanium, and it's very versatile to, um, to be kept within the body and be implanted within the body. Um, it's compatible with CT, MRI scans, so it's it's the, the sensible decision. What's covering that part of her skull at the moment? Uh, at the moment, it's only, it, well, she has no skull. What's covering the brain is, is only skin and the dura, which is the, the layers of fibrous tissue that, that cover the brain. So um, clearly, she, she would, you know, her brain is quite vulnerable to relatively minor minor trauma. That's, what, that's why it's essential that it's covered before she can you know, lead a, a normal, uh, uh, carefree life. Given the extent of the injury, so we didn't get to talk to you when she when she left the hospital, we saw her walking out and smiling, uh, and now we've seen the image of just how much of her skull is missing. How much of a, you know, how surprised are you at the progress she's made? You know, how, how severe was the injury? Could you give us a sense of, you know, the level of recovery that she's made as a, as a teenage girl? Um, I mean, her, her recovery is remarkable, and, and it's, a, it's undoubtedly a testament, first and foremost, I guess, to her resilience and, and her, her strength. I mean, obviously, also a testament to the skill, skill of um, some of the, the technical teams in this organisation. But first and foremost, it's, it's about her desire to get better and, and her strength. Um, there is also no doubt that the surgery performed in Pakistan was life-saving. Uh, uh, I mean. You know, she came over here, as you know, because there's not necessarily the expertise for all the reconstructive surgery that has been undertaken here. But, but you know, had that first operation not been at, at such a high standard, she certainly wouldn't, wouldn't have, have survived. I guess the flip side of that is that young patients do do much better. You know, at 14, 15, the brain is still developing and still growing and is able to adapt to damage much better than, than somebody of my age would be, for, for instance. And given the sort of... We know that serious head injuries can have other effects, memory loss, that kind yes. of thing. Is she suffering any of those other symptoms that one would associate with that type of injury? Uh, no, she, no, she's not. Uh, and you know, we've obviously looked very carefully. You know, obviously, we have an enormous amount of experience with head injury, and there, there are lots of ramifications of head injury, including, as you say, memory loss, subtle changes, uh, and in, uh, indeed hormone changes. And she's been checked out for all of that, and, and there appear to be, at this stage, no long term sequelae for her. Hi, Jer Jeremy Cook. Um, I wonder if I can ask you each a question, please. First one, as the months go by, what's Malala like, her personality, how is she, how is she coping, what sort of a, a girl is she, maybe one for you. And the, the other one um, is, given all of your experience here treating soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, is that making you world leaders in this sort of surgery, in this sort of reconstructive entertainment plate surgery that we're talking about? 
Okay. Uh, in terms of in terms of Malala, uh, I mean, as I've said before, she is she's a remarkable uh, young lady. She she really is. Uh, you know, she's very lively. She's got a great sense of humour. She's well aware of. Uh, you know, she she's not naive uh, at all about the. Yeah, you, you know the, what happened to her and the situation she's looking forward to in, in terms of being a high-profile uh, person and potentially a high-profile target. I guess as would seem by some people, she's not naive to any of that, but she remains incredibly cheerful, incredibly determined, and incredibly determined to continue to speak f for her cause. She, she really is a remarkable young lady. Um, in terms of the expertise, um, it's definitely talk about the plates. I mean, I think what's I don't think we have. Do, I think it would be fair to say I don't think we have done anything here that couldn't be done elsewhere. If you look at each individual procedure, I think what's pretty unique, certainly in the UK, about this organisation is that we can do all of them in the same organisation. So uh, the, you know, the, I don't think there's anything you know no one else could do. But it's doing all of them at the same I guess time. The point was that you, you've been obliged to do a, a lot of it. Is yes. That a sad circumstance? We we have with the military, as you say. But I'll, uh, I was, uh, I'm going to hand over to Stefan. But you know, with our expertise in cranial reconstruction goes back further than our military involvement. Mr. Stephen, do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, as um, Dr. Ross is saying, it is a case of what we're doing here could be done in other units, but because we're such a large super-regional unit with a, a large neurosurgical input, um, we see a lot more um, advanced, uh, complex cranial defects by craniotomy sites. So we are, I suppose, fortunate in that aspect to see a lot more complex cases, and, and we have the the software and the topography here to to overcome that. So, it's it's a huge bonus, definitely. Um, this is Malala's last surgery. We and hope we hope so. Yes. Fingers crossed. Um, how is she excited to sort of be seeing the end of the surgical route to this, and, and how is she approaching the, the further therapies that she'll need, both psychological and physical, for continued care? Oh, and I think she's like. Um, I don't think her emotions at this stage are any different to anybody else's. I mean, everybody undergoing surgery um, is nervous. Uh, it would be foolish not to, and she certainly is not foolish. Uh, as you say, she's certainly pleased um, with the thought that this will be the end of it. I think she's certainly pleased that um, once her, her brain is, is more appropriately protected by, by this plate, she'll be able to do some of the things that um, she's obviously not, not literally but metaphorically been in cotton wool a little, just make sure that there's, she doesn't bang her head. Um, so I think she, she's looking forward to that. Um, in terms of the hearing, that's probably a more long-term thing. I mean, the cochlear implant wouldn't be turned on for a month, and it does take the brain some time to get used to them. So it's not a, it's not a sort of magic cure to normal hearing, and uh, she understands that. She's been counselled at length about that. So you know that's another pretty long road. But, but in general terms, as I say, I, mean, I don't think her feelings are any different from anybody else undergoing this sort of ma major surgery. You know, she has confidence in our our team. She's got a really good relationship with with the doctors and nurses will be looking after her because she's met them many times. Uh, uh, you know, she's clearly very confident in them, um, but she's all clearly a bit apprehensive, as you'd expect. Is it possible to put a time frame, if things go well without any unexpected complications, of when you think she might be, you'd be able to sign off for a saying as fully as recovered as she's ever going to be? Um, generally speaking, uh, and it's very, very crude and not specific to her, but generally speaking, the answer to that would be in, in the region of 15 to 18 months. We recognise that any, anybody who's uh, required a lengthy intensive care stay or undergone significant neurological injuries, um, studies tell us that people don't report feeling as well as they used to for you know, 15 to 18 months. The officiators, hello. Um, obviously there's all surgeries risky, but are there any particular risk factors involved in these procedures that you are worried about? Uh, I mean, they are, they are generic risks. I mean, there is always a risk of bleeding. Bleeding near the brain is a bigger risk than, than bleeding elsewhere, for obvious reasons. Uh, there's always a risk of infection. Uh, as Stefan says, the, the titanium itself is not particularly an infection risk, but any you know, time you breach the skin, you, you run the risk of infection. Um, and you know, patients undergoing surgery have a lot of drugs, so there's also always a risk of um, uh, adverse reactions to any of the, the drugs that they have, although she will almost certainly be having the same anaesthetic drugs as she had last time, so that's a theoretical risk, I think. Um, I don't, there's no specific risk. I mean, clearly, 
the, the neurosurgeon will not be operating on the brain as such, but clearly they will be operating very close to the, to the brain. Uh, and there is less margin for error when you're dealing with the brain than lots of other tissues. But, um, but you know, it's a procedure. We, we do about 50 of the crani cranioplasties a year here, and um, uh, it, it's not associated with a significant problem rate. And do you ever do them in such a young person as well? Is it? But it, it, I mean, normally we uh, have an age cut off of 16, being an adult hospital. Malala is nearly 16, so in, in physiological medical, medical terms, it, it makes no difference. Certainly, we, I mean, Stephanie, again, you'd, you'd know better, but the age, there are plenty of young patients, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. So, Nick Schiffer from, from ABC. Compared to the surgeries that she had in Pakistan, what she's already had, would you describe these procedures as? Sorry. Compare, compared to the surgery that she's compared to the surgeries that she's already had, yeah. you describe these procedures as relatively routine and less traumatic. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly cochlear implants uh, for us is a routine procedure. Again, we do about 50, 50 of them a year. Um, it, as I said earlier, it's potentially a little bit more complicated because of the presence of the plate and a little bit bit of disordered anatomy. But essentially, that's. That's a pretty routine procedure. I mean, it's very easy for me to sit here, of course, because I'm not the, not the surgeon. But uh, uh, and again, fitting the plates, we do about 50 a year. Most of those would would be elective. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you, I think it's probably reasonable to say that the the most critical operation in terms of her survival was was that first one in, in Pakistan. Uh, but clearly, we, we we weren't there at that that stage. And certainly, there should be less risk with this procedure than there was at that stage. So you talk about Malala being aware of her her profile mm. on the planet and the fact that she's also aware that she's a target. How do you, how does she let you know about that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I'm, because I'm not involved, I don't spend much time with Malala. I speak to her uh, every now and again, so I'm probably not the best person to, to ask that. She's, she's well supported mm -hmm. by her family. She's well supported by a lot of people. Uh, uh, you know, in, in the organisation and of course there is a big um, uh, community in Birmingham from you know, the same part of the world uh, as her and there's a lot of support for her from there. Um, I, you know, I, she, she's, she's coping, I mean I don't, you know, I, I, I don't particularly want to go, go into too much detail of her, her, how she copes with it really, that, that's, that's for her really. There's a lot, it's a, a lot of weight on young shoulders, isn't it is. quite apart from the it is, yeah. medical side of it. It is. Uh, and uh, as I said, I mean, I can only repeat what I've said. She's a remarkable young lady. She's not, she's not um, pretending it's not there. She's she's dealing with it and stepping up to it. She's quite remarkable. Thank you, Michelle. Not having this news. Her hearing. Will she recover her hearing in her left ear totally, or is that? Um, she without a cochlear implant, she would never recover any hearing uh, in her left ear. Um, he, the sort of hearing you get from a cochlear implant is different to normal he normal hearing. Um, again, this sort of thing is quite difficult to describe because um, uh, hearing hearing is a sensation, and we all hear that sensation slightly differently. What we know is that most patients uh, with a unilateral cochlear implant uh, develop um, bilateral hearing, which obviously the key advantage of that is allowing allowing uh, directional hearing. So you can hear a car coming on the street and I can know which one of you is asking me a question, that, that sort of thing, which is obviously important. It takes about a year to get to the point where the brain adapts and starts meshing the two, the two properly. So I guess on, on one level her hearing would never be normal, as, you, uh, you know, as I would say is, is normal. Uh, but but um, she will get to a point where she's very, very likely to get to a point where she has normal um, uh, bilateral hearing. Does the titanium plate ever need replacing years, decades down the line, or is that will stay in place forever now? It, it's, yeah, it should stay in place forever, you know, pending the, the, the only possible reason for its removal would be potentially infection, so, yeah, it should, yeah, <coughs> indefinitely stay in place. Okay. Well, if there's no more questions. Oh. How long have you been performing this, um, this surgical operation? How advanced is it? Which one? The, the, the rebuilding of the, the skull. Well, I mean, um, craniotomy sites and cranioplasties have been going back to um, Egyptian times. Uh, you know, whether it be, whatever material you decide to use, the, 
the uh, craniotomy and cranioplasty. The various cranioplasties that have been used over the years are seashell, coral, you know, that it just it goes back for thousands of years. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, no one's talking about the thing that's happening here.